So if nothing else, this conference has certainly induced a fair amount of humility uh, in um, those of us who have had the privilege to listen to the people whom Richard has uh, gathered here, and that is certainly the case also for me in the face of Mark Hansen's work, and it's work that I've known for a long time, but of course had uh, a good reason to indulge in a re-immersion in preparation for this. So out of that humility, I'm going to actually say less about the work with which I'm sure uh, you're all familiar and will be hearing new work today, and a little bit more about the context to which I believe Mark is speaking. So where are we? We start with, uh, although Richard was making a distinction between the post-human and the non-human, there are ways and, um, in which I believe they certainly come together that have to do with the nature of convergence. Digitization, of course, starts around the turn of the 20th century. By the 40s, what we, the first round of convergence, what we actually mean by that term, which is the um, intermingling of computer and communication technologies takes place in the military. By the 50s, that comes out into the corporate world. By the mid-50s, we have our first legal problems dealing with the consequences of convergence. By the 60s, we have it in popular culture, experientially in happenings, and Marshall McLuhan starts talking about it. By the 70s, it's a problem in international relations. We're struggling over the new world information order, and countries around the world are letting go of their telecommunications operations uh, because they don't know how to manage it. By the 80s, some of us are teaching convergence to our intro-level communication classes because it's recognized as the foundation of what's going on in our communications environment. In the 90s, Henry Jenkins wakes up and starts talking about it, and it becomes a popular topic among academics who think, um, who now realize they should start talking about something that started happening 50 years earlier. And in the 21st century, the National Science Foundation starts funding uh, research in what is now the horizon of convergence, which is the embed technologies, nano, bio, information technologies, and cognitive technologies. That's where convergence is today. If we look at that from another perspective, we see the question of how is it that humans um, relate to technologies and how do technologies affect how we uh, interact with quote unquote reality. If you start that uh, from, there are lots of ways again of starting that conversation, but if you start it with a visual orientation as Hansen did in his own work, um, we start with work like Benjamin and technologies as a barrier to experience. Um, we can think about Heidegger and others who talk about technologies as shaping experience, a very different way of thinking about it. For McLuhan, that technologies our experience, um, by the t time we get to thinkers such as Baudrillard, technologies are the reality that is experienced. And in this environment, in an NBEC convergence environment in which we're talking about nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, information technologies, and cognitive technologies, it is really that the humans are technologies as well, and the distinction between the human and the technological has disappeared. So what kind of work do we see in an index convergence uh, environment? We're now about a decade after the military started issuing calls for the co-research that would uh, involve the co-design of humans and technologies. They were interested in things like what biotechnology folks could do for human eyes and to design that in conjunction with the, right, with the weapons that those eyes would then be using. So we're 10 years past that. Uh, happening. You have work like my own of what I call post-human law. We've had the assumption that laws about humans making decisions about society on behalf to serve social goals, but in fact the law is now often about technologies making decisions about humans on behalf of machinic goals, or humans making those decisions preferencing machinic systems over social systems. In this environment, I think Mark uh, Hansen's work, as he has all throughout his career, brings us to the most fundamental of questions, which is, what is it to be human in this environment? And one of the things I've admired most about his work over time, and something which unfortunately doesn't characterize all thinkers or scholars or researchers, is the ability to see new questions as they come up, rather than clinging to uh, and making a research industry out of a question addressed earlier. So um, I won't read the, uh, the titles of the five books that are already out or the dozens of articles that are already out there, but the questions that he's thinking about now have to do with, again, what is it to be human in the imbic 
convergence environment, my term not his, on the nature of the environment, uh, asking questions about what is it to sense things, um, it, whether that is in the world around us or ourselves, the nature of affect, and picking up on a theme that has been growing in importance over the course of this time conference, uh, the nature of temporality of this environment. So Mark, we look forward to what you have to tell us about um, uh, against clairvoyance, the future of 21st century media. Um, thank you very much, Sandra, and I hope that indeed what I have to say today actually does represent a sort of new step in my own work, um, and it will touch quite a bit on the question of time exactly as it's implicated in the kinds of environments of convergence that you were describing. Um, I also want to thank Richard and uh, Mary and Allie and everybody else who's connected with the conference, um, Richard for inviting me, everybody else for making things work so well, and all of you who are here. Uh, okay, I want to say first something about my title. Um, it's Against Clairvoyance, the Future of, new, of 21st Century Media, and I mean it in both senses, right? The future of that kind of media and also the future according to 21st Century Media. And what I'm really going to be uh, interrogating today is the status of the future and the way, that the way that it's implicated in media and what media can say about it. So I'm extremely happy to have this chance to share with you some of the results of my engagement with the experiential impact of what I'm calling 21st century media, um, perhaps hubristically or overreachingly since it's only 2012, um, but at any rate. Um, and, and especially the different and very difficult challenges that in my opinion it poses to our models for theorizing media and especially for theorizing uh, media from the dimension or the angle of experience and its impact on experience. And this is, I, I've written a paper for this conference, but the paper really is uh, drawn from a book that I've just about completed um, that seeks to think through 21st century media and White, Whitehead's philosophy. In particular, Whitehead's philosophy is a resource for thinking 21st century media, um, where in fact, um, it's not an application of Whitehead to 21st century media, but a bi-directional kind of exploration that um, that causes me to, in fact, transform some of uh, the concepts that I, um, that, I, that I draw from Whitehead. And, and in my opinion, and I'll just throw this out here um, as a way of contextualizing it, to offer a kind of different entry into Whitehead than what most of the work that's been done on Whitehead recently um, has done. And just as a way of schematically putting that out there, um, I'm less interested in following along with the kind of parallels and sometimes divergences between Whitehead and Deleuze that seems to be a point of entry for many people working on Whitehead today. Not that I don't respect it or think it's interesting, um, but I'm more interested in focusing on some of the other dimensions of Whitehead that seem to be left out a little bit in my opinion here and I would draw your attention specifically to two things. First of all, Whitehead's interest in quantification and I'm extremely interested in taking very seriously what Whitehead says about data, and he means data in the sense of datum, um, but trying to think about how that works together with um, the sense of data that's closer to home for those of us who are media theorists, right? Data, computational data, and so on. Um, and the other dimension is speculation, and the notion that Whitehead in his edifice of um, actual entities or occasions um, prehending the entirety of the universe is in fact offering us a speculative account, not an experiential account, but a speculative account that is necessary in order to explain how our experience is what it is. And I suppose I want to uphold the division following people like Stengers and DeBase, the division between these two things, but I want to do that in the, in the, in the service of, I, I wouldn't say a phenomenology, phenomenologizing of Whitehead, but a bringing Whitehead together with some central themes of a lot of the research I've done on phenomenology recently, and in particular, the theme of sensibility. Um, so why is Whitehead fruitful for, for 21st century media for me? Um, basically, he situates, he gives us the resources to develop a non-human or non-anthropocentric uh, aspect of uh, a model of media, right? He situates media beneath human forms of experience directly within the microtexture of the settled world that forms the potentiality for new actualizations. And I'm going to throw out some claims I make about Whitehead, which may be contentious ones, but I do this just to kind of give you something to grab onto for the talk that then I will give. Um, so 
I make a number of claims about Whitehead, um, drawing largely on a couple of philosophers, Jorge Nobo, who's written a book about the continuum, about solidarity and the extensive continuum in Whitehead, and Judith Jones, who's written a fantastic book about intensity. So my claims are that potentiality is ontologically more fundamental than actuality, and in fact, paradoxically, is contained inside of actuality uh, in Whitehead. Uh, secondly, that potentiality is rooted in the superjectile power of the settled world or attained actualities, which are not, as Whitehead mostly puts it, and most of his commentators put it, which are not passive, but which have superjectile subjectivity, the power to impact the future. Right, and here I draw very heavily from Novo's reading of the importance of the dating phase as inaugurating the process that will result in concrescences. The third claim is that I draw attention to the key operation of intensity as the product of contrasts of settled actualities that yields the dative phase inaugurating new actualities. Fourth is that I reject Whitehead's account of eternal objects as eternal and I draw on John Dewey's criticism of Whitehead um, in order to argue that eternal objects emerge within the flux of experience in the resourcefulness of experience. And I think also that eternal objects are limited, it's not that they don't exist, but they're limited to qualifying compressing actualities. Uh, and in contrast, vibration and the vibratory continuum, and I get this actually from Steve Goodman, uh, furnishes a more general sensibility or a concept of sensibility that qualifies the operation of superjects, right? So we have uh, eternal objects qualifying subjective entities, compressences, but there's a general worldly sensibility that is there as potentiality before him. Fifth argument and last uh, is that I argue for a concept of non-perceptual sensation in the place of non-sensuous perception. I argue that sensibility is first and foremost worldly, not relative to a particular recipient, once we dispense with the privilege of perception proper, which Whitehead begins to do in making his distinction between the two modes of perception, but which I argue needs to be carried further, there is nothing in virtue of which to qualify the sensing of causal efficacy as non-sensuous perception. Okay, so in sum, Whitehead gives me some resources to think media as environmental in a radical way, or as environmental and worldly prior to um, being subjective in any kind of um, unitary sense. Okay, so I want to turn now to 21st century media and say a little something about what it is I aim in, in using this term. I aim to specify what makes new forms of media in our world today different in significant ways from their manifold forebears encompassing everything from social media and data mining to passive sensing and environmental microsensors, 21st century media designates media following its shift from a past-directed recording platform to a data-driven anticipation of the future. Okay, now I want to show you a couple of film clips just to make this more um, cloth monkey-like and friendly um, and interesting, perhaps. Um, a couple of clips that you'll recognize, certainly the first and probably the second.
My second clip is from the TV show Person of Interest. It's prefaced by an advertisement, which I can't figure out how to translate. Introducing new fresh dates. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
person of interest, um, all they get is a name. Well, a number that corresponds to a name. They have no idea whether it's the perpetrator of a murder or the victim or somebody else that's somebody involved in it. And they just have to get involved, and they don't have any access to the meaning of the data that can interpret the data. So this is the difference for me between these two um, uh, artifacts of culture. So those familiar with my work will know that I've for some time now been interested in exploring how the advent of the digital computer as the general platform for media interrupts the circuits linking media and experience. Specifically, given that computational processes occur at time frames well below the thresholds constitutive of human perceptual experience, they seem to introduce levels of operationality that impact our experience without yielding any perceptual correlate. While this situation remained relatively benign, so long as it directed our focus to machine-generated photographs or the material specificity of hypertext fictions, it seems to me that it has become markedly less benign over the past decade as Google has consolidated its monopoly over the internet searching and data, data aggregation in the process of perfecting a system for extracting data value from our every keystroke, as Facebook has consolidated its monopoly over sociality on the internet in the process of perfecting a system for delivering client profiles to advertisers, and in general, as today's data industries have honed methods for mining data about our behavior that feature as their key element the complete bypassing of consciousness, the direct targeting of what I shall call the operational present of sensibility. The question that these developments leave me with is the following. How can we reestablish sensory access to the sensibility that now seems to be out of our reach and perhaps more fundamentally, why is it imperative that we, do, that we do so? It is my firm conviction that to do this, we must utilize the affordances of the very technologies that are responsible for marginalizing our sensory experience. We must, that is, find ways to enlist the various operations of data gathering and computational sensing that bypass consciousness in a project of re-engineering our sensory existence. To this end, one major aim of my current project is to rethink the pharmacology of media as it operates through 21st century media. First introduced into media studies by a Derrida's reading of the Pharmacon, or Plato, to designate a poison that is also its own antidote, writing, and substantially developed further in Bernard Stiegler's philosophy of media techniques, pharmacology conceptualizes the way that media, from the invention of writing on, simultaneously diminish and supplement diminish and supplement sensory, perceptual, and expressive capacities of humans. As it obtains in relation to 21st century media, pharmacology, in my opinion, calls for a fairly radical re-engineering of human experience that not only accepts the assistance of computational data gathering and analysis, but that embraces the qualified yet undeniable demotion of certain aspects of human experience, sense perception and consciousness, that it brings with it. As grim as this may perhaps seem, let me also say that I believe there is an upside to this pharmacological development of human existence. I believe that the expanded sensory contact with worldly sensibility it affords recompenses us for the loss of more properly agential, or at least traditionally agential, human powers. To develop the theoretical resources necessary for describing this pharmacological re-engineering of human existence, I, like a number of other media scholars today, turn to Whitehead's process philosophy. For me, what Whitehead affords is an ontology of becoming that is neutral in relation to the human-non-human -human divide, even as it aims to explain human experience, and that for this precise reason furnishes a foundation upon which we can theorize the re-engineering of human experience in a manner that grasps its upside, that finds something of benefit in the shift from agent-centered perception to environmental sensibility. I don't want to overwhelm you with too many details of my understanding of Whitehead, but do want to introduce what I take to be the ground for any re-engineering of human sensibility, namely the expansion of the concept of perception that Whitehead carries out in the process and reality. There, as many of you would probably be familiar with, Whitehead distinguishes between two modes of pure perception. Perception in the mode of presentational immediacy, which correlates to what we've long called sense perception, or what philosophers have long called sense perception, and a second mode, perception in the mode of causal efficacy, which is largely unprecedented in the history of philosophy before Whitehead, but which may have certain affinities to explorations of bodily perception by Merleau-Ponty and other more recent philosophers. 
Perception in the mode of causal efficacy designates a vague, inchoate form of perception of the causal background of experience itself, and is fleetingly glimpsable in moments when we recognize that we, quote, see with our eyes or touch with our hands. Whitehead's development of this distinction, mainly in process and reality, aims to fill out the picture of perception, meaning that it aims to position sense perception proper against a far broader material background, the host of processes, the causal efficacy that informs and produces its eventual emergence. Even on the basis of this simplified uh, presentation, we can get a sense of what's at stake in Whitehead's reform of perception. By opening up perception beyond sense perception proper to the material processes that do not manifest in sense perception, but that nevertheless are necessary for its emergence, Whitehead significantly broadens the scope of what figures into the sphere of perception. It is this development that has proven most exciting to many of Whitehead's contemporary fans. For cultural theorists and media critics like Brian Asumi, Aaron Manning, Stephen Shavira, Luciano Parisi, and Steve Goodman, Whitehead's broadening of perception facilitates an exploration of the just before of perception, a way of thickening the present of perception by folding into it its immediately past causal efficacy. As Parisi's exploration of bionic technologies makes clear, just as an example, the payoff for this line of thinking is a capacity to, quote, feel thought before it becomes available to sense perception. Bionic technologies are, she argues, quote, crucial for extracting sensing potentials below and above frequencies of habitual sensory perception. They directly connect with the causal field of sensation, accounting not simply for sensory motor perception, but more importantly, for the causal in intricacies of the physical and the non-physical, whereby thought itself is felt. This development of Whitehead, important as it is, represents, in my opinion, only one of at least two potential developments of the conceptualization of causal efficacy. By ratifying Whitehead's own redefinition of perception in the mode of causal efficacy as non-sensuous perception in Adventures of Ideas, Whitehead um, brings, introduces this new term, non-sensuous perception, for perception in the mode of causal efficacy in that text. Um, and in, in, where it is in Adventures of Ideas strictly identified with the immediate past of sensory perception, with that, quote, portion of our past lying between a tenth of a second and a half a second ago. So by identifying and ratifying this redefinition of Whitehead, these critics foreclose what I take to be, and Whitehead does as well, the far more radical and more interesting implications of Whitehead's nuancing of perception, namely the way that it opens human life to a direct, if leveled and mediated contact with the domain of causal efficacy informing perception in both of its modes, a domain that I propose to rechristen worldly sensibility that does not and cannot appear through perception in any human-based form, including perception in the mode of causal efficacy, but that can be accessed by means of biometric and environmental computational sensing agents. This more radical development, or I say it's more radical, um, development of causal efficacy supports a model for the technical distribution of sensibility whereby humans with their limited sensuous and non-sensuous perceptual capacities are given digital insight into their own robust sensory contact with the world. The potential for this insight to be useful, both insofar as it enhances the intensity of experience and insofar as it can guide behavior in the future, is what gives me hope that there is indeed a pharmacological recompense to 20th century, 21st century media. To explore how this might work, let me now try to flesh out two other implication of, implications of Whitehead's process philosophy that elucidate the affinities of his ontology with today's data-centric, predictive, and future-oriented media sphere, and that make him in my opinion, the preeminent philosopher of 21st century media. The first concerns how Whitehead understands the role of potentiality in the genesis of the new, and specifically the way that real potentiality, the potentiality of the settled universe, betokens a certain feeling of the future in the present. As I see it, Whitehead's thinking furnishes an understanding of data as dynamically oriented toward the future, and for this reason provides an explanation for the power of prediction that lies at the heart of today's predictive industries, and that gives a certain substance to cultural fantasies of control over the future. 
The second aspect I want to explore concerns the capacity of a Whiteheadian model for the technical distribution of sensibility to address the specifically temporal predicament in which humans currently find themselves, which is to say, living in a world where data industries, both private and governmental, have become increasingly able to hijack the domain of causal efficacy, the precognitive domain of sensibility, by directly targeting and accessing the operational present of sensibility in a manner absolutely disjoined from, and not just prior to, the emergence of any future consciousness and any future embodiment that it will help to cause. In both cases, I shall make my arguments by thinking through a concrete case study. So, consider the example of Recorded Future. Recorded Future is a small Swedish intelligence company that sells a data analytics service for predicting future events. Initially financed by small venture capital grants from two very large entities, the CIA and Google, Recorded Future has developed algorithms that make predictions about future events entirely based on publicly available information, including news articles, financial reports, blogs, RSS feeds, Facebook posts, and tweets. Recorded Future has a client base that includes banks, government agencies, and hedge funds. What it offers is a service designed to monitor the likelihood of future events, or as the company's press puts it, a, quote, new tool that allows you to visualize the future. first-generation search engines like Lycos and Alta Vista, and rather than analyzing the explicit links between web pages with the aim of promoting these, those with the most links, as Google has done since the introduction of its page rank algorithm in 1998, Recorded Future examines implicit links. Implicit links, or what it calls invisible links between documents, are those links that obtain not because of any direct connection between them, but because they refer <coughs> to the same entity or event. To do this, Recorded Future does not simply use metadata embedded into documents, but actually separates the content contained in documents from what they are about. Recorded Future's algorithms are able to identify in the documents themselves references to events and entities that exist outside of them, and on the basis of such identification, to create an entirely new network of affiliations that establish relations of meaning and knowledge between documents, rather than mere associations. What is most crucial here is what Recorded Future does with the references it identifies, how it manages to construct those shadow references into a meaningful knowledge network with predictive power. To do this, Recorded Future ranks the entities and events themselves that its algorithms have identified. It ranks them based on a myriad of factors, the most important of which include the number of references to them, the credibility of the documents referring to them, 
and the occurrence of different entities and events in the same document. The result of this analysis is a momentum score that combined with a sentiment valuation, as we heard, indexes the power of the event or entity with respect to its potential future impact. To fully appreciate the substantial predictive power of, future, of recorded future, we must introduce the second feature, temporal dynamics. Recorded future includes a time and space dimension of documents in its evaluation, which allows it to score events and entities that are yet to happen on the basis of present knowledge about them, what Whitehead would call data of the settled universe. As recorded futures co-founder Stefan Trouvet observes, quote, references to when and where an event will take place are crucial, since many documents actually refer to events expected to take place in the future. By using RSS feeds, recorded future is able to integrate publishing time as an index to this temporal analysis. Such temporal analysis affords recorded future the capacity to weight opinions about the likely happening and timing of future events using algorithmically processed crowdsourcing and statistical analysis of historical records of related series of such events. The result, differentially weighted predictions about the future. At first glance, this procedure may appear to dovetail with Bernard Stiegler's account of how today's media industries support or obstruct protention, a term introduced by Edmund Husserl to designate the manner in which the living present already includes a foretaste of the future. For Stiegler, the problem of culture today is its failure to facilitate any sense for a viable future, hence his appropriation of the punk slogan, no future. Stiegler's wager is that this failure can be understood analytically through a transformative updating of Husserl's model of time consciousness. According to this updating, contemporary cultural industrial products, movies, television, advertising, marketing, video games, and so on, now monopolize the production of collective secondary memories, which according to Stiegler provide the source for anticipations of, and expectations for the future. For Stiegler, the reason there can be no viable future is that this industrial manufactured source has literally taken the place of natural or lived secondary memories and thus of collective cultural traditions that following his reasoning could in fact furnish a living source for the invention of viable futures. As a consequence, whatever we can imagine, anticipate, or expect, according to him, are mere projections of possible futures that are rooted in and emerge as permutations of past manufactured or tertiary memories. But how would this situation change if we were to develop a theory of retention on the basis of a media platform like recorded future? Whatever affinity there may be between Stiegler's model of retention as projection on the basis of manufactured collective secondary memories and recorded future's weighted probabilities concerning future events, their methods are fundamentally dissimilar. For whereas Stiegler's model operates in relation to a static source of fixed possibilities, a situation reinforced by its discretization of memory in the past as tertiary, that is, recorded and inert contents of experience, Recorded future operates in terms of probabilities that are generated not simply through a processing of the repository of past inert data of experience, but crucially through the power of present data to lay claim on the future. Right? And beyond that, um, Stiegler's analysis of protention is limited to mental contents of human time consciousness. Recorded future, just as an example, um, uses a huge amount of data most of which is inaccessible to human mentality in any direct way. Let us now explore another crucial Whiteheadian concept, the beautiful thought that the entirety of the settled universe is implicated in every cycle of actualization. More than any other, it is this notion that gives ontological consistency to the idea that the future is already active as potentiality in the present. By saying that every actuality prehends the entirety of the universe as it exists at the moment of its becoming, bizarre as this thought is, I think Whitehead means something fairly commonsensical. He means something like this, that every actuality, every new element in the universe arises on the basis of all of what has come before. Otherwise put, every actuality takes into account and is in essence generated on the basis of the real potentiality of the settled universe at the moment of its genesis. Indeed, we can say that what is prehended is potentiality, the superjective subjectivity that attaches to every element of the entire settled world, and that following the category of subjective intensity from process and reality, quote, aims at intensity of feeling in the relevant future. So in saying that every actuality prehends the entirety of the universe, 
Whitehead is in effect arguing not just that every actuality includes in its present feeling its potential to impact future actualities, but also, and to my mind more importantly, that it feels the potentiality for the future in its present. What ensures that potentiality implicates the future and the present is the solidarity that Whitehead attributes to the extensive continuum. The extensive continuum is real, he writes, quote, because it expresses a fact derived from the actual world and concerning the contemporary actual world. All actual entities are related according to the determinations of this continuum, and all possible actual entities in the future must exemplify these determinations in their relations with the already actual world. The reality of the future is bound up with the reality of this continuum. It is the reality of what is potential in its character of a real component of what is actual. On this account, what implicates the future in the present is nothing less than the entirety of causal nexuses operative at any moment in the ongoing process of the universe, or more concretely, in any given settled state of the superjectal world. This is the wellspring of real potentiality. Whitehead's speculative account of the solidarity of the universe and the crucial role it accords potentiality both of and for the future addresses the total causal reality of a situation that is, by definition, beyond empirical access. On this ground, we can contrast it with systems for predictive analytics that no matter how sophisticated their algorithms become and how much data they will be able to process, by necessity operate on delimited sets of data. In this sense, Whitehead's process philosophy furnishes a general ontology of probabilistic potentiality, which puts it in a position to explain how our data-centric world works. Even though it exceeds, or rather precisely because it exceeds the grasp of any particular predictive system, Whitehead's ontology of the total situation and his account of the future's inherence in the present explains what gives prediction its substance, the implication of future potentiality as a real power in the actual present. With this conclusion, we can begin to explore how third-generation search technologies like Recorded Future might, in fact, contribute to the pharmacological recompense of 21st century media. By taking full advantage of recently acquired technical capacities for text analysis, Recorded Future dispenses with the closed-loop analysis of past behavior and channels predictive power directly through the reference of present data to future entities and events. In this sense, we might say that recorded future concretizes Whitehead's understanding of how the future is felt by the present, that is, by reference. Thus, Whitehead writes, quote, actual fact includes in its own constitution real potentiality which is referent beyond itself. A Whiteheadian understanding of recorded future thus reveals a positive dimension of prediction, more than a mere extrapolation of the causal force of the present and the past to future possibility, prediction concerns the potentiality contained in the transition from present to future. The key point is that this potentiality, despite being imperfectly reliable as a ground for prediction, has ontological power. Indeed, it is precisely this power that is at issue in Whitehead's claim that potentiality is the mode through which the future is felt in the present. Let us return to the question of the pharmacological promise of data mining and predictive analytics. And predictive analytics. How, we can now ask, does Whitehead's speculative grounding of prediction in the power of potentiality help us to discern and excavate a compensatory dimension within a transformation of contemporary capitalism that seems predicated on the bypassing of consciousness and the wholesale marginalization of human agency? The answer is at least twofold. First, by furnishing a speculative account of the total situation, right, again, meaning not something that we can access empirically, right, by furnishing a speculative account of the total situation informing the genesis of every new actuality, Whitehead's account, in effect, foregrounds the impossibility for any empirical analytic system, no matter how computationally sophisticated and how much data it can process, to grapple with the entirety of real potentiality or anything close to it. In this sense, it serves as a crucial check on the grandiose and clearly misguided desire driving today's data industries, the desire to, as Recorded Futures co-founders put it, organize the world for analysis. Second, by facilitating a model of technical distribution of sensibility rooted in an expansion of perception beyond consciousness and beyond bodily self-perception, Whitehead's philosophy makes room for a technical platform like Recorded Future to impact human experience in ways that go beyond the narrow and largely instrumental purposes that inform governmental and corporate deployments of it. 
to uh, The ability to predict future events by way of present reference introduces a means to tap into the wealth of microtemporal data inaccessible to human perception and to make it useful for the shaping of human behavior in the future following the operation of what I call feed forward. Isn't this twofold investment in the power of potentiality precisely the source for the appeal of the recent television drama Person of Interest in the sense that it features superhero-like characters who have imperfect knowledge of the predictions of an all-knowing but fully mysterious machine and who must act and must embrace the uncertainties of acting if they are to prevent predicted future murders. What person of interest dramatizes is a technical distribution of agency in which a highly sophisticated computational machine accesses data of worldly sensibility and feeds it forward into human experience. Unlike the film Minority Report, there is, in person of interest, no possibility for an existential moment of self-recognition where one can modify one's precognized fate. Rather, the characters blindly follow the clue furnished by the machine until they can, by acting in the near future-oriented present, figure out how the person identified by that clue is involved in a future murder and act to prevent its occurrence. Gone here is any hope for a reconciliation of the knowledge afforded by data, the precog's visions of the near future, and the knowledge afforded by experience, the numbers generated by the machine, which correspond to identities of persons, broke no interpretation, but function simply to trigger an action-based process of search that never fails to yield the desired goal of preventing murder. What makes the person of interest so resonant with my general claim concerning the specificity of 21st century media is its taken for granted embrace of the machine as a sophisticated cognitive agent whose workings remain absolutely inscrutable to humans, indeed unquestionably beyond human exploration and understanding as such. From what little we are told about the machine, we know that it possesses, I'm sorry, we know that it processes massive amounts of video surveillance and cell phone data, the passive data that lies at the heart of 21st century media, in order to make predictions concerning the future. By depicting a co-functioning between machine and the characters acting on its predictions, person of interest allegorizes the very condition I am seeking to theorize, the imperative for us to embrace the qualified marginalization of consciousness that goes together with any opportunity we might have to benefit from the technical access to the operational present of sensibility. Indeed, with its various compensatory narratives, one episode, for example, involves the salvation of a post-9-11 war veteran whose guilt over the death of a fellow soldier and desire to support his family has led him to commit multiple armed robberies. So with its various compensatory narratives, person of interest could well be read as an allegory of the pharmacological recompense of 21st century media. By depicting the use of data extracted from human activity, not as a new source of economic value, but as a basis for superhero-like doing good, the show capitalizes on the potential and the popular desire for cold, quantitative, dare I say, in human data to benefit human life. The pharmacological recompense specific to 21st century media requires an embrace of the very marginalization of consciousness that comprises the strategy of today's data industries. No longer can we take up embodiment as a site where diffuse data is processed to yield images or experiences, as I myself have argued in my own previous work. Rather, in the face of technical incursions that render the body directly readable by machines and readable at the level of uh, micro-sensibilities of the body. We must embrace a conception of the body as a society of micro-sensibilities themselves atomically susceptible to technical capture. A stark illustration of this new porousness of the body comes by way of DARPA's research, military research on a project on operational neuroscience, where human consciousness and attention is bypassed entirely in favor of a total instrumentalization of the human brain. The project focuses on improving the task of pattern recognition as it informs the reading of satellite images by trained experts. Human experts in recognizing targets of interest, such as military bases or bomb-making facilities, are hooked up to fMRI machines that take readings of their neural activity as they watch images. Rather than waiting for the human experts to report in a subjective mode, drawing on introspection, on their observations, information is extracted directly from the neural firing patterns captured by these images. This technique, which leaves the human, or at least the human as an experiencing entity, 
entirely outside the informational circuit yields a massive acceleration in the identification of targets of interest. Indeed, the human component of this recognition system is no longer even confronted with a whole image or an identifiable territory, right, as um, Anderton in Minority Report looks at the dream images from pre visions, but rather they are confronted with cut up sections of such satellite images flashed before their eyes at a rate of 10 images per second. This research project bypasses the temporal limitations, the slowness of human cognitive and perceptual faculties of presentation, and taps directly into the neural data indicating pre-perceptual sensory response, all in the effort to increase the efficiency of target identification. As I understand it here, this example, I'm not saying this is how data industries now work, right? Um, but, I, but I understand the example as pinpointing the desire that's driving today's data and intelligence industries. The, the capacity, the desire for the capacity to bypass human forms of recognition in favor of a direct access to the operational presence of sensibility. Indeed, what this example perfectly brings home is the temporal terrain on which the struggle for intelligence now takes place. With respect to temporally sensitive tasks like target identification or financial trading, the slowness of integral bodily time can no longer be tolerated. Bodily perception always comes too late, for by the time the body can integrate sensibility into a coherent perceptual organization, the force and living presence of sensibility will have faded into the past. This temporal gap is precisely what gets artifactualized through the reading of organs performed by today's microcomputational sensors. The capacity to gather microtemporal data concerning worldly sensibility, the capacity to report at the level of the organ or the microsensibility, exposes the lag of the body in relation to sensibility and positions computational sensing in the place formerly occupied by the integrated body. No one has more forcefully grasped this situation than Nigel Thrift, who culminates his account of worlding as the following of propensities with a frightening clarification of how today's data industries seek to re-engineer a presence in a way that leaves any durational remainder of human embodiment completely out of the picture. This re-engineering of presence operates by constructing, quote, a giant temporal shortcut. For all their comparative speed, Thrift argues, neural, quote, neural and genetic changes still take time, still take time to impact the body. But now, courtesy of new technical practices which are driven by the logic of propensity and make appeals directly to particular biological territories, simulations of their work, the work of neural and genetic changes that still take time, simulations of their work can come into existence all but immediately as sensations and perceptions, or I would say as pseudo-sensations and perceptions. What Thrift here depicts is a system in which pseudo-phenomenological lures immediate non-lived engineered simulations of experience without any temporal thickness are offered to humans in the place of the durational accomplishments of embodied life. Or life. It's Baudrillard-like hyperbole notwithstanding, what Thrift's dark analysis forcefully expresses is that humans have no direct embodied access to the data of sensibility. Not only is the operational present of sensibility inaccessible via consciousness, it is inaccessible via those processes of affectivity that have been invoked by me and others as the site where humans might in fact experience the pre-perceptual. To the extent that it bypasses both consciousness and embodied affectivity in its solicitation of instantaneous attention, the contemporary capitalization of the operational presence of sensibility makes salient a reality that has been clear to scientists and to historians of science for 150 years that the space of the missing half second, the space of brain time, is a thoroughly technical artifact that yields no possibility for a fine tuning of human perceptual or proto-perceptual affective faculties. As historian of science Henning Schmidtgen has compellingly argued, the space of the missing half second is and has been since its initial discovery by Helmholtz in the 1860s, a result of a cyborg assemblage in the laboratory. Far from being a space of action in which a new and more fine-grained faculty of perception or proto-perception can emerge, the brain time of the missing half-second is a technical artifact through and through, the product of a distributed technical system in which the human forms one not necessarily privileged component. More precisely still, it is the product of a co-functioning of human and machine 
where the temporal disjunction between them becomes paramount. The techniques of the laboratory permit access to levels of experience that are temporally too fine-grained to be directly accessible to human modes of perception, and that can only be brought to human attention through the results of experimental processes. So I want to really claim that these experiments, and this is Wundt's, uh, Wilhelm Wundt's um, uh, chron it's a chron chronometer for measuring um, sensation, um, that these experiments are the kind of prehistory and prototypes for the kinds of distributed technical systems that, um, that I think these data technologies I'm talking about from today um, bring into the realm of possibility. Despite this inaccessibility and the ensuing necessity for technical mediation, there is nothing about the datification of sensibility that requires it to be divorced from and used against higher order agencies of perception, right? That's a, a fact of the way that um, data industries are operating to short circuit um, these larger circuits of human experience, right? Not a necessity in any sense, um, the contingency of capitalism. From this reality arises the political imperative facing media theory today. Not only must we contest the industrial colonization of the microtime of experience, but we must do so by imagining and by creating circuits that make use of specific affordances of technical data gathering and analysis, not to anticipate and manipulate our tendencies and susceptibilities before they manifest themselves, but rather to inform us about these tendencies and susceptibilities, and in this way, both enhance our capacities to shape our future experience and restore a thicker sphere of presence that henceforth must, in, must envelope the operationality of worldly sensibility. With all of this in mind, let me now return to the question concerning the specificity of 21st century media, and specifically address how it correlates with the isolation of the operational present of sensibility. Let me suggest that media in our world today directly modulate worldly sensibility itself, and by doing so, shape sensation, or potentially shape sensation, before the emergence of bodily self-perception and consciousness. Understood as such, media help us to appreciate and indeed directly inform the primordial place of the sensory and its fundamental connection to causal efficacy. Accordingly, rather than defining sensibility and causal efficacy in relation to a present of perception, as Whitehead and his followers do by narrowing it to non-sensuous perception, we must define perception in relation to a present of sensibility. On such an understanding, causal efficacy would no longer be the, the just past of a present of consciousness whether this be understood by a whitehead or by a visceral, but is itself the relevant operational present in relation to which bodily perception and consciousness are still to come neutral emergences. In light of this situation, one that, to emphasize it yet again, is only made possible by our technical access to the operational present of sensibility, it should be clear that media theory must change its object. It must address the operational present of sensibility for this and not any future anterior detour by a bodily sensibility or consciousness is where media, primor primordial, where media primordially shapes sensibility. <clears throat> what is required is a politics of sensibility that in contrast to the politics of memory articulated by Bernard Stiegler focuses on the power of the present of sensibility to shape future experience. In this respect, we owe something to the contemporary capitalist targeting and isolation of the operational present of sensibility for it is this targeting and isolation that exposes the powerlessness of any media theory premised on the projection of the future through past achievements of perception and consciousness. As soon as it becomes correlated with bodily self-perception and consciousness, media can only be about the past. From the standpoint of their respective presence, bodily self-perception and consciousness will have missed any and all opportunity to intervene in the operational present of sensibility. For media to address the future, and for us to have any chance of protending a viable future, media must be engaged at the level of its modulating of sensibility as causal efficacy, where it has the power to shape emergent experience to come, including the perceptual experience characteristic of the human. And I'm going to conclude just by discussing one more example. Um, an example that begins to unpack the potential for feeding data of causal efficacy forward into future consciousness comes by way of MIT researcher Sandy Pentland's work at the Human Dynamics Laboratory. With his colleagues, Pentland has developed a portable digital device called, called a sociometer that registers a wealth of data concerning nonverbal elements of behavioral interactions, bodily movement, non-linguistic social signals, bodily location in space, physical proximity to other bodies, biometrics, and so on.
When used to coach managers on strategies for salary negotiation, the data from the sociometer has proven invaluable and far more effective than any introspective analysis of the event as this was experienced by embodied consciousness. Pentland's work with the sociometer perfectly captures the temporal specificity of data's availability to experience, for it operates to capture such data with the specific purpose of making it accessible in a future moment of reflection to consciousness. Precisely because of the temporal disjunction between registration of behavioral data and the scope of conscious awareness, the former, understood as the registration of data concerning causal efficacy, cannot be directly channeled through human understanding. It quite literally comes before such understanding, and as such can impact it only in the mode of prediction. That explains why Pentland stresses the future impact of his research. The technology of reality mining uses sensor data to extract subtle patterns that predict future human behavior. This independent access to data of causal efficacy calls into operation what I theorize as the feed-forward structure of experience. This feed-forward structure dictates that disparate elements of higher-order human experience, each one of which is an experience in its own right, become unified for presentation to consciousness only through their convergence around a future moment to come. On the model of experience that correlates with 21st century media, sensory life sheds its dependence on presentation in sense perception and consciousness and becomes directly addressable and those formerly dominant higher order modalities, sense perception and consciousness, become after the fact and hence future effects of sensibility. What is perhaps most important about this speed forward structure is how it presents an opportunity for higher order human capacities to benefit from the increased access to data of worldly sensibility afforded by today's computational microsensing. In this respect, the precognitive anticipatory orientation facilitated by direct technical access to worldly sensibility furnishes a much expanded domain for appreciating how the consistency of human experience involves a complex overlay of multiple levels. Far from only operating the marginalization of the human, the precognitive dimension of experience promises to strengthen the operation, knowledge, and power of embodied consciousness precisely by indirectly feeding it information that it could not otherwise access at all. Thus, we must emphasize the pharmacological imperative here. Rather than identifying the precognitive with the capacity for prediction obtained through reduction of a worldly process to a closed behavioral circuit, it is imperative that we retain the openness of worldly sensibility and that we conceptualize the precognitive as the power of the operational present of sensibility to impact the future, including the future of consciousness, the future that is or will be consciousness. Insofar as this power can only be partially predicted, insofar as it remains partially indeterminate and potential, it correlates with Nigel Thrift's conception of how the modulation of media co contributes to the process of worlding, understood as, quote, the harnessing and working with process in order to produce particular propensities. Just as the aim of worlding is to shape the development of active spaces which support our consistency, so too should the aim of precognition be to influence the future on the basis of what the operational present affords, on the basis of its real potentiality. Thank you. Given the arguments the government's using in the Bradley Manning trial, the guy who gave the tables of the police, 
anybody who followed WikiLeaks on Twitter is potentially going to be subject to a charge of treason that's available to the government with arguments that have already been accepted. John Ashcroft, who was uh, Attorney General at the time, has a, an interesting parallel website to the one that you talked about where he's looking at invisible networks mm -hmm. and alleged networks. Mm -hmm. And so all of that criminalization becomes available. So given that, what would be the um, implications of what is to be done question for content producers, given mm -hmm. the political uh, and ethical and very uh, real empirical consequences of this kind of activity? I mean, it's a good question. It's one that I don't know if I can answer. Although, I do think that, um, you know, that a lot is to be done in terms of, you know, political activism in relation to information that's kept private and so on and so forth, right? I mean, the stakes of this are huge, as we're pointing out, right? Um, that, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know how it would impact, like, the ethical duty of somebody producing content, say. I mean, well, you have any ideas for well where you pushed me further was we know that they're you know, they're, de they're determining a negative inference on, the, on our part by looking at what we serve and what we do and right. whether that can be a certain news article. Where are you looking into the territory that just talked? Was thinking about the fact of uh, if if they're drawing that, then what it is you're looking at becomes the point of information in a different kind of sense, and so it just opened up the question to me of what then the obligations or the concerns of content. I mean, it seems like it seems like a content producer. I mean, it seems like a, a, an organization like Facebook is complicit in a lot of ways with this, right? Because that for them, like they don't. I mean, ultimately, they're offering a service, right? They're offering a service that allows people to coordinate their communications, to have connection, you know, more facilitate connection with others, and so on, right? So they're offering the kind of, you know, a content-based entertainment or, or or whatever service. But in fact, you know, what they're also doing is logging all kinds of data about what people are doing. And they, they don't really care what your activity on, you know, the more activity the better in a certain sense. So in my opinion, that's the structure of the entire industry. There's a kind of split, you know, whereas in the case of writing as a, as a form of logical technology, right, you have, you have the, the withering of your memory as the harm, you have the extension as the immediate or the direct remedy of that harm. You don't have that anymore in the case of social media and computational networks that I'm talking about because of the, what's offered is a kind of a lure, right? It's a kind of a pseudo um, level that doesn't have anything to do with what's really going on, which is the extraction of data based on the traces that you're leaving, you know, and, and then all of the legal and extra legal um, structures that are set up on the basis of that, right? So I don't know, I don't know the answer. I mean, I, you know, I don't know the answer. I can't answer that. Um, and in some ways, it's not my, it's not what I'm interested in. What I am interested in is, is pinpointing the necessity for a political analysis. I mean, one thing I'm interested in doing of this entire situation, right? And it certainly resonates with a lot of what you're saying, with everything that you're saying. Um, I don't know, does anyone else have a better answer? Or an answer to that question? Because I don't, I mean, I don't have one to that specific part of the question. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it's not an answer, but it struck me that when the craft ad came up, that's, that's, uh, that's not really about like advertising a product. I mean, it does that work, but something extra that it does is it tracks what kind of operating system you're using, what kind of browser you're active, what our IP address is, like where we are. And because that content is being is coming from somewhere else, and you use uh, these websites that have commercials that pop up, they use a service, and that service is in contact with all different advertisers, then you get these really clear uh, lines of data back through the ads, which makes the ads a uh, whole different thing. And so, at one point, uh, pop-up blockers became popular, and now we don't deal with pop-ups very often, or at least I don't on my machine. Um, but there's also like ad blocking that's becoming, I think, the new like. Pop -up so there blocker. is a way that I could like play this clip without the ad having to watch the. Yeah, ad yeah, and what's really interesting about some of the services of ad blockers is it it doesn't just uh, disable those clips, but it shows you exactly like. Not just that clip, but the ten other things that it was about to do um, before your brother. Like it was kind of like in Wendy's talk when she was talking about packet sniffing. Like there are there are te techniques to start doing that with these ads. But it also like, records that you did that, just as if you use an anonymizer, it's telling you that you chose to anonymize. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so they still get something as far as like what's happening, but but there are ways to kind of like um, you know put thresholds on that. 
Um, and then I also noticed two, two other things that were really interesting to me. Um, first of all, there's a kind of inverse move vis-a-vis -vis Harman's work of uh, uh, Heidegger. Uh, Harman said that Heidegger was wrong in that uh, he, he maintained that potentiality was higher than actuality. Um, and he, Harman basically says actuality is higher than potentiality. And then you say Whitehead's focus on actuality should be oriented, reoriented towards the privilege of potentiality as more fundamental. And in both cases, there's a kind of claim that this idea is already sort of germinal in the, the thinker's own work, like that it's there in the Uber. And then, uh, so that's, that's a sort of inverse. And then secondly, I'm not sure if this is an inverse or a, a kind of parallel convergence as well, but Harmon says that Heidegger's temporal stasis was not really about time about the projection of an actually existing object in the now point. Um, and you're saying that white as entities pretend to the future as potentiality and not as actuality. So in a sense, it seems like you're kind of bringing that particular take on the stasis into your interpretation of what's going on in Whitehead. Would you, would you say those, those are adequate characterizations? <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is, I mean, I would certainly have to Yeah. I, I, I um, and also, like, question, right? <laughs> but, uh, like, may maybe it's what seems kind of core to what's going on here is it seems like you're trying to do something similar to what Graham's doing, but you're doing it in an almost inverse way, especially with regard to the issue of potentiality. That's, I mean, that's, that's cool to hear that. Um, and I certainly have read Graham's work, um, and I find it interesting and, and really, as somebody who spent a lot of time reading Heidegger, a little strange also. <laughs> Not in a bad way, but really strange. But I mean, I, I, I didn't, wasn't thinking about Graham Harmon in doing this work. And I guess my question would be, like, um, what's to be gained? What's to be gained from making those kinds of comparisons? Well, in this it, case? it speaks to a certain set of issues that are kind of salient in white as Kruza that kind of need to be addressed, and that. So, so Harmon's work could give the resources for, for no, that? No, no, I'm not saying that he's the only one who can do it. I'm just saying that what he might have, he's probably right about having identified some of these issues. Right. And it's just whether or not it's the influence, whether or not you're even thinking about it, I think that it speaks to the fact that some of the things that these diagnosed are salient components of uh, problems, like in the technical mechanics, and that you're doing something similar in a different sort of way. So I hate to call this. But can I just let she have her hand up from the beginning yeah. over here? So the mm -hmm. recorded futures tells us we have breakout sessions in ten minutes. <laughs> 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 I'll come very quickly and maybe we can take a slightly different From a not very sophisticated theoretical perspective, I think that um, the first thing that I want to say is that